Whether you are a noob or a pro, it is never too late to elevate your horde base builds in seven days to die. With these 100 horde base building tips, you'll be trivializing the horde in no time. We cover everything from general game mechanics, electricity, to advanced AI pathing strategies, anti-rage setups, cop spit, safe layouts, and much more. Included in this tips and tricks guide are many example bases, how-to builds, and links to specific videos for more in-depth coverage on a specific topic. Feel free to skip to the section of your choice as all sections are timestamped. Though if you decide not to skip, you may learn something new and surprising. Welcome everyone. This is Eerie Knight of the Pseudoposse and I love building bases. The engineer in me is always in creative mode trying to push the boundaries and explore new strategies. I've been gearing up to make this video for quite a while and I feel I've accumulated enough information to finally share with you all. Many of these tips are derived from previous videos we've done, so if you want a deeper dive into a particular topic, check out the description, look up the tip number, and click the associated link for that video. I think it makes sense to start with an explanation of the horde and building mechanics, so feel free to skip this part if you feel you have a good foundation, but you may learn something new that you weren't aware of previously. As all the more advanced tips rely on this fundamental knowledge, let's all get on the same page. Our first tip will simply be a clear explanation of the horde mechanics. When a horde starts, the total number that will spawn will be dependent on your game stage, which can be calculated by a player level plus days survived times difficulty bonus, where days survived is reset after deaths and difficulty is dictated by the game setting from the main menu. In general, a horde can have up to three waves, though early hordes will only have one to two. In each wave, there's a total number of zombies that will spawn, which increases for higher game stage. There is a limit for how many zombies appear on screen based on the max alive parameter. Max alive has a hard cap of 64 zombies from the game engine. Setting the Blood Moon Horde concurrent zombies from the settings menu will set a lower cap if you choose a value lower than 64. Finally, each game stage horde will have a specified max alive count, which if it is higher than any of the previous caps, it will be reduced to that cap value. Each wave has a duration that will spawn a group of zombies with different probabilities to spawn individual zombies within that group. Once the duration, two hours after all hordes after game stage 49 has expired, or the player kills all zombies in a wave, the next one will start. Once all waves are defeated or the player reaches 4 a.m., the horde ends. During each wave, zombies will spawn about 40 blocks or so from a single spawn region with some variation. So if they spawn at a location south of your base, they will continue to do so for that wave and won't spawn north of your base. Once a new wave starts, a new spawn region is randomly chosen. It isn't dependent on player position or orientation. Lastly, during each wave, different zombie groups are randomly selected so it is possible to get a wave with no vultures or cops, for example. Now let's cover some various zombie behaviors which we will leverage later on. Zombies follow the path of least resistance. If there are two paths to the player, the zombie will take the shortest route. However, if there are blocks obstructing their path, they will go the path with the lower hit points. You can use this to your advantage to route zombies to specific areas of your base in the more advanced building tips. If the zombies have no path to you, they will try to collapse the structure you are standing on. There is an exception to the rule. If a door is used to obstruct the pathway, zombies are attracted to doors even if the hit points of the door is greater than the hit points of the other path. Oh my god. Run, run, over! Oh, to avoid this, make sure to heavily reinforce sections with doors that directly lead to the player position or avoid door placement like that in its entirety. Avoid zombies clustering, unless you are creating a kill zone using electric traps or grenades. Zombies getting stuck along the path is never good, as they'll start beating on the supports, walls, or the path itself. Zombies when running along the perimeter of a base generally like to hug the contours of the structure. This could be an outer perimeter wall or fence or along a staircase. That is why it is good practice to streamline their path. In the case of stairs, that means using corner stair pieces. If they get stuck at any point, they are very likely to start beating on the structure. To avoid this, you can make their path easier, like in this example, in which I took out the corner so they'd stop getting stuck. Because zombies spawn in a set general location during the horde, that can create some problems if your base is too big. 
big. If you have a set of stairs that leads to your location on the far side of where zombies spawn, they will consider that too far and instead try to beat their way through the base. Thus, if you make a large base, make multiple entry points for zombies to access no matter where they spawn. What shape should you use for your fighting position? You could double up hatches or shutters to provide coverage. They also double as a means of ingress and egress. However, it does make it difficult to deal with spiders or dogs as they can't be easily targeted. When constructing a fighting position, reinforcing the region in which zombies are trying to reach you can be the difference between life and dinner for the zombies. There are a multitude of shapes you can use, but regardless of which shape you pick, always double up. Rotate the shapes such that they are adjacent to each other, providing extra hit points between you and the zombies, adding extra reinforcement to your position. If you have another means of entry into your base, there are better choices than hatches or shutters. Scaffolds are one of the best choices as they prevent cop spit from hitting you, and you can melee shoot through them and throw grenades. Thin windows also provide the same functionality. You can also use bars or railings for shooting through, but you cannot melee through them. Double poles give you a very sleek look, but you best have a means of taking care of cops as spit can travel through them. Next, we are going to go over the basics of electricity, which will be fundamental in incorporating electric traps into your horde bases. Generators and battery banks generate electricity based on the amount of engines for generators and the amount and quality of batteries for battery banks. The maximum amount of power generated is 300 watts. Switching to the wired tool, electricity flows in the direction of the striped bands. Everything connected to the generator will draw from the available power if there is a valid connection and the generator is turned on. Making a direct connection from a generator to something that draws power will automatically consume power from the generator. However, Power can be controlled via switches and triggers like tripwire pressure plates and motion sensors. When a switch is in the off state, anything connected downstream of the switch will be off. However, turning it on will activate everything connected to it. Similar idea with triggers, when these are activated, anything connected to them will receive power as long as the trigger duration is active. The maximum length of a wire, or in other words, the maximum distance between two electrical components is 14 blocks. This is the space in between the voxel occupied by each electrical device. To get the right distance, place down an electrical device, start counting from one at the adjacent block, and once you reach the 15th block, place the second device. In between both devices are 14 blocks. In the case of 1x5 pressure plates, the distance between this device and any other component is also 14 blocks. However, the range is counted assuming the middle block is the location of the pressure plate. Start counting one after the middle of this block, and once you reach 15, plop down the next one. The maximum outbound connections, that is to say, the number of times you can connect from a single device to another one is nine times. Trying to connect a tenth device will display the below message. However, the inbound connection, that is to say, the number of connections device can receive from another one is limited to one. Generator has no inbound connections. Sorry, buddy. If you need to connect your generator or some other devices that are beyond the wiring range, relays and relay timers can be positioned somewhere in between to serve as an intermediary connection. Just be careful to place these somewhere safe as if they are destroyed, all power will be lost downstream. Whereas relays are always powered, relay timers have the added functionality to toggle between on and off states. Both relays visually look the same, except the timer relay has a little old fashioned timer at the base of the model. Simply specify the start and end time and outbound power will only flow through the relay during those hours. Some example usages are to automatically power your lights when evening hits and turn them off in the morning or to automatically turn on all your electric traps at the start of a horde. Speaking of electric traps, dart traps fire in a single direction covering the trajectory of the dart projectile. They have a maximum range of 25 blocks. Everything within that zone can get hit by a dart, so make sure everything is routed to that area except yourself. You stay far away. Always guard your dart traps. They only have 2,500 hit points, so place them behind a block that darts can pass through, like arrow slits, railings, windows, pretty much anything with an opening. Typically, darts are placed such that darts travel parallel to the ground, but if you need more killing power, placing them so they shoot up or down can provide extra DPS in confined quarters. This orientation also serves well for guarding ladders. Or conversely, you could place dart traps behind ladders using arrow slip blocks as cover for them. A nifty trick I like to do is you to use corner railings, bars, as stairs so zombies will jump up them. However, placing dart traps below them not only provides protection for the dart traps, but also allows you to shoot at zombies that are jumping and climbing, something that dart 
traps placed conventionally are unable to do. Blade traps are damn fragile, like ridiculously fragile. They take 4 damage every time they slice a zombie and naturally take damage if a zombie whacks them. As such, it is highly advisable if you use these glass cannons and for the love of god keep them in repairable range. If you do not, just don't use them. They'll go down very fast and you'll just waste resources. Either have an open field of view to the blade traps or use railings which allow you to repair through them. To maximize their effect, Place them in confined space so zombies have no other choice but to get sliced by them. Again, obey tip number 24 as a confined space means a lot of zombies so they'll go down quickly if not supervised. And finally, the best zombie smoothies are made with stacked blade traps. Drink up my friends. I generally avoid turrets as they chew through ammo thus using lots of resources. But if you insist upon using them, place them in confined areas so they don't chew through ammo and waste shots. Every bullet counts in the apocalypse. Electric fence posts are one of the most versatile traps in the game which provide great crowd control stunning zombies so other traps, guns, explosives can kill them. Like blade traps, they take damage when hit, eh, rather shock a zombie so keeping them within repairable range is important for longevity. Again, I like to use railing blocks for this purpose if they are on the other side of a wall or floor, or just make them directly within field of view with no obstruction. And remember, the repairable end is the fence post receiving the incoming connection from the first fence post. Multiple fence posts can be chained together, so which ones are the repairable posts? Answer: Every one is repairable except the first, so if you're connecting them like this, make sure to repair every one, again, except the first. If space is tight in your base, consider placing your fence posts vertically. You can cover the same space without needing a wider structure to support the fence posts. This is also quite suitable for covering ladders. In Alpha 20, the best place to position electric fence posts was one block lower than the path in which zombies would traverse. Reason being, it would catch your normal zombie plus the small ones like spiders and zombie dogs. However, that no longer works in Alpha 21. Zombies simply pass over it without getting hit. So instead, if you place fence posts on the same level and then raise the path using half blocks, dogs will get hit by the fence posts. Conversely, if your fence posts are one block lower than your path, you could remove the full blocks from the path and replace with halves. One thing to note here is that darts cannot travel over the half blocks if you are using darts with fence posts. In that case, placing quarter cube blocks will allow darts to pass over while also hitting all zombie dogs and regular zombies. Electric traps are rarely connected directly to a power source as not only does it waste fuel, but it also wastes ammo in the case of dart traps. Triggers are extremely vital when incorporating electric traps in your base. Tripwire has a very long but narrow coverage as it works by zombies passing through the wire. It is best to place either end on the other side of blocks. Any block will do as the wire passes through all blocks. Due to its trigger area, it works especially well in narrow areas and it is frequently used in combination with fence posts and or dart traps as you want those activated when zombies are within that exact region. Motion sensors are great for covering regions that are difficult to place other traps. They cannot see through solid blocks, so place it in a spot with a clear field of view. Shapes like like bars, railings, windows, scaffolds can be used to provide some protection. It is best to aim in a direction that cannot be accidentally triggered. In this particular example, I want zombies passing through this opening to get shocked by electric fence posts. It wouldn't do me any good to have zombies on the other side trigger it, so I am aiming at the floor to cut off the sensor region to a confined space. Pressure plates are really good in places in which zombies won't aggro, as in rage mode, or out of the line of fire from the players as their hit points are low. I use these when Whenever it is awkward to put a tripwire and a motion sensor won't do either because it is too wide out in the open or just simply no place to put the sensor. Another reason to use them out of player line of fire is if you are facing cops or demos. Either of their explosions will instantly destroy your trigger plates. One thing that is especially useful no matter what the trigger you are using is that they can be daisy chained together to trigger off a single trap. For example, if you have zombies coming from multiple directions that lead to a fence post, it could be useful to connect tripwires from one entrance to the tripwires of another entrance and even to a different trigger like a motion sensor guarding another entrance. By connecting them in series with the last one connecting to the trap itself, passing through any one of these triggers will set off the trap. Another useful scenario is to create a longer network of pressure plates to cover a larger pathway. This is also quite useful in setting up an automated door that opens on either side. Connect your trigger of choice to one of your triggers, say, on the outside, and then route the wire to the sensor to the inside and finally to the door. Now, when you walk towards the door from the outside, it will open. Same for walking towards the door from the inside. This can also be used with drawbridges for an automated bridge entrance and exit. 
Be aware that if trigger durations are different for each trigger, the duration of the activated component downstream gear door will be powered for the duration length according to the trigger activated. Here, stepping on a plate with a trigger of 10 seconds versus a trigger of 2 seconds will open the door for that respective length. Those are all the electric defenses. What about static ones? Unfortunately, your only option there is wood or iron spikes. They are very resource intensive, don't last long, with limited killing range and power, generally not worth using. There is one excellent use case, but more on that a bit later. However, if you are determined to use any of them around your base, they can be useful as a deterrence behind a stronger barricade, so any random zombie wandering in will get killed. You definitely don't want spikes to be the main point of your defense. Next, I want to touch upon the use of hatches, doors, garage doors, shutters, aside from the obvious use as a means of ingress and egress. Hatches when used in a narrow corridor can serve as a useful defensive barricade. Simply place your hatch down and leave a single empty block space above. This will allow you to pass through and when hatches are opened, will create a barrier that zombies cannot pass. For entertaining examples of this, pick a Glock 9 video at random. To prevent zombies from crawling through that one open block space, put something like a pole block there adjacent to the ceiling. This will create a less than one meter opening that you can still pass through, but zombies can no longer crawl. Another major use for hatches is to create paths for zombies to reach you. Place down some powered hatches, connect them to a tripwire, and once zombies reach the wire, all zombies on the path will fall. Setting up hatches like this will prevent most zombies from reaching you. This can be used in a variety of ways to dumb zombies a long distance down or into some sort of kill zone. A more advanced way to use these are to create multiple hatch paths to the player. Recall that zombies will go the shortest path of least resistance to the player. Also recall zombies spawn in a different location each wave, thus if you have multiple entrances into your base, the path they are closest to will differ. We can leverage the zombie pathing AI by having it go the shortest route, to bait a trigger opening the hatches essentially closing off that path. Assuming your alternative hatch paths are the next shortest path of least resistance, they will all route towards that path while the original hatches are up. This next path is actually a longer route than the optimal path, causing zombies to waste more time in reaching you. An even more cunning way to screw with the zombie AI is to create at least two paths. The first path needs to be a static path that zombies have difficulty crossing. More on that later. Regardless of what you use, put some trigger like the pressure plates in the first path and connect those to the hatches of the second path. For those keeping track, the pressure plates are making use of tip 40 here. Set the trigger duration to something low like 4 or 5 seconds. For the second pathway, rotate the hatches such that when they are closed, they do not create a path like this set up here. When the hatches are opened creating a second path, it is actually a shorter route to the player than the first path. Thus when zombies run the first route, they activate the second shorter one, immediately causing zombies to reroute that way. But since the trigger duration is so short, again like 4 or 5 seconds, the hatches close breaking the pathway, causing them to reroute back to the first path. If done right, we can have zombies absolutely befuddled, running back and forth like this all night long. An arguably even more advanced way to use hatches is what I call the automated shuffling corridor. It is a bit too much to explain, so check out the original video on that if you're curious. But here is the very short gist. I've always wished there was a trigger that would activate based on the number of zombies. So if you were being overwhelmed somewhere, the fence is about to collapse, the trigger would activate dropping all the zombies down from hatches to relieve the pressure in the overwhelmed area. It would open up another path for zombies to go through instead. Such a configuration would protect yourself if you didn't have time to react before you were overwhelmed, or if you were elsewhere defending, it would save you in that eventuality. Unfortunately, there is no such sensor, but we can approximate it by being clever conniving bastards. Using a simple example, use fence posts running through a hatch pathway to crowd up zombies. Once they reach the end, they trigger a tripwire falling down relieving the pressure. While they do so, they drop through another tripwire opening up another path. Time the tripwire duration such that the initial hatches close again, meaning they open up the pathway, as the second set of hatches close, meaning the pathway is shut off. This example is for two paths, but you can use the same process to connect multiple paths in this fashion. The base I did had four paths in which zombies were herded around the base multiple times 
as corridors close and open. For those that want to keep it simple, another novel way to use hatches is to place them obstructing a pathway which is itself made from the very narrow block shape like the pillar 0.025 meter side centered shapes. Zombies reaching the hatches will start to beat on it. They'll lose their footing in the process dropping down, uses a lot less hatches in the full path and achieves a similar effect on a smaller scale. For the survivor on a budget, it goes without saying that power doors and garage doors can be used in much the same way as hatches. Zombies see those as a path as well so you can mix and match hatches doors garage doors any way you like naturally doors cover a larger area so you can create a larger drop zone garage doors in alpha 20 used to have the capability to shove zombies off ladders as seen in my alpha 20 video here however now it simply passes through zombies when opening in alpha 21 so rest in peace essentially this tip is don't use that for any purpose anymore you be warned oh i almost forgot shutters since they don't have a powered option their utility is more limited, but they make excellent covers to melee shoot throw consumables through, or as a cover to a nice grenade shoot. They are an excellent choice for another reason, to be revealed later. Entering your base safely without zombies following you inside is generally a good idea. One of my go-to cheap ways of entering my base is constructing a ladder two blocks above the ground. If you built that high, zombies won't see it as a path and you can easily jump onto it. You know, unless you're a taco bear. Unless you want zombies to traverse your ladders inside your base as a part of the path, I will always use this rule in the interior of my base if I don't want zombies to see an unintentional alternative path by beating through the walls and climbing up a series of completed ladders. Thus, make sure you don't accidentally create a path for zombies by giving them a bunch of ladders inside your base. Back to base entry. There are several blocks in the game that zombies do not see as a path because, I don't know, reasons? But just because they cannot see them as a path doesn't mean you cannot cross them yourself. Here's a list of some block shapes that can be used in this manner. Another option is by using the power of electricity. Powered hatches, doors, drawbridges can be set up to serve this function as well for a high tech option. Set up using tip 38 so you can enter and exit from either side. I feel like I just recently mentioned grenade shoots, so no better time to bring these up like the present. They are very easy to construct and can help guide your grenades to their intended target. Place some sloped blocks like regular ramps, wedges, or the arrow slit ramp if you want something stylish. Place these from your fighting position down to your wall. Make a hole in the wall for the grenades to pass through, but don't leave a full gap, as sometimes zombies can get the idea to try and climb up. So any block that will leave a sizable gap will do. To cap off your grenade shoot on the floor, place some shutters down. An alternative way to guide your grenades down to their intended target is to place a series of ramps projecting outward from your base around the area you want your grenades to land. Lobbing grenades against these will cause them to bounce and land where they will be most useful. Another useful tip for guiding grenades down to their target is to use the cube one meter hole to guide them down to a lower section of the base. In this base design, zombies pass through a narrow corridor, so I simply need to lob some grenades down the hole to achieve maximum carnage. How do you know when to throw grenades? Say you are defending in another part of your base and a great opportunity arises to get an effective grenade in. Or in this scenario, it can be difficult to see in the water at night, so visibility is a major problem problem. A simple trick you can do is to give yourself a warning system. Route some tripwire passing through the target zone and connect it to a light bulb. Zombies pass through, light goes on, you throw a grenade, light, boom, done. Cool. Structural stability dictates how many blocks you can connect before it collapses. The key stats here are the horizontal support and the mass. Divide the horizontal support by the mass of the attached blocks and that is how many blocks it can support. That being said, steel, the strongest building material, can only support 15 steel blocks. Adding an additional block will cause collapse. Because of this limitation, building large open structures spanning wide open spaces is not possible without a bunch of support columns. When I constructed my tower building, bridge and ferris wheel bases, I ran into this issue with wanting to support a bridge in a large circular structure without a bunch of ugly supports. The solution is to use very small blocks to try to hide them. In Alpha 20, I used the door trim corner shape, but now there is an even smaller block the pillar 0.025 meter outside corner shape, which is absolutely tiny. On a smaller scale, another way to provide support to a suspended structure is to use horizontal supports. This is rather obvious, but the downside of that is if you are not 
careful, zombies could use those horizontal supports to take shortcuts on your path or otherwise beat on blocks you don't want them to. So recall earlier from tip 57 that there are blocks zombies don't see as viable pathways. You could use any of these types of shapes as blocks to support suspended structures and zombies won't cross over them. I like to use the pillar 0.05 meter or 0.025 meter or even the 0.0125 meter pillar shapes as they look like supports and for whatever reason, zombies do not see them like paths unlike pillars with centered middle or side centered in their names. In a few of my recent Darkness Falls bases, I use these to support a windy path zombies need to follow. For this base, that means attaching them from the POI to the path for the support to avoid zombies from taking any shortcuts. And lastly, for this suspended base that has no vertical supports, the pillar pathway wasn't enough to support the mass, so I added two pillar 0.0125 meter shapes on either side to provide extra stability. Another good use for these kinds of blocks, the ones that zombies don't see as a path, is to block off sections of your base from being directly attacked. In this pillar jump base I constructed, zombies falling down can enter rage mode and to prevent them from hitting the main tower, I put unpathable blocks around it to keep it safe. And going back to my Darkness Falls base again, while while horizontal supports provide a lot of stability, there are still several vertical supports that need protection. Placing these blocks around the supports provides an invisible barrier. One important thing to note about these shapes are that they need to be built with no pathable blocks underneath, which includes the ground. Put any pathable block below one and zombies will travel over it. So make sure there is an empty space underneath between that shape and the ground or another pathable block. Since I just mentioned rage mode a couple tips ago, now's a good time as any to discuss some anti-rage strategies. First, what is rage? When a zombie is hit by the player or falls down from an adequate height, say from a closing hatch, the zombie has a chance to enter rage mode. This chance is increased by difficulty setting. Rage mode simply means zombies start randomly beating on blocks near them if they're not near the player. This can be quite bad in base designs as they can destroy and ultimately collapse vital parts of the base. So how to counter? Here are two easy ways. First, if zombies fall more than 11 blocks high far enough from the player, there is a near zero chance of rage mode. Any height less than that can cause issues. Credit goes to Cautious Pancake for discovering that tidbit. The second easy method. Water is cool, soothing, and the perfect anti-rage strategy. Either build over water, job done, or grab your buckets and get ready to fill a pool of water at least three blocks deep below any region in which you expect zombies to fall. Electric traps such as dart traps and electric fence posts are another way of stopping rage in its tracks. If a zombie takes damage from another source, its rage gets reset. Hit a zombie once, utter rage. Hit a zombie twice, pacified. Another great option to avoid raging zombies to give them a gentle slide to the bottom. If you use wedge narrow shapes below the region in which zombies fall, they will gently slide to the ground, happy and content and rage free. A less elegant option to protect yourself from the rage is to give zombies something else to beat on. Let them rage and waste their energy on beating on something that isn't vital to your base. In this particular design, I have these distraction supports that don't actually support the base. Upon falling, zombies will beat on it, wasting their rage on something that is superfluous to the base's stability. Up until now, we've discussed mainly above ground bases, but what about the subterranean variety? Many of the prior tips will apply, but there are some special caveats for this type of base. First, how do you get zombies down to you in the first place? Building a hole straight down is a solid first step, but zombies are too smart and won't just jump down. What you need to do is place a pathable blocks lining the walls of your hole, and zombies will see that as a path to you and will willingly jump down. Make sure you take some anti-rage precautions when they reach the bottom. The major danger with under ground bases are that zombies are prolific tunnelers. They will dig down in all directions to reach you. One way to avoid this is to simply reinforce the region above you. If it is thick enough, it will deter zombies, but for late game stage hordes, it needs to be very thick to stop them. The more effective solution is thus to build your base within the confines of your hole, leading the zombies down to you. So if you have a 7x7 hole, build your base underneath the region where zombies fall within that same 7x7 region. If properly reinforced, it is the most simplistic way to stop digging, though it does restrict the base design itself. So let's say you decide to build on water. You found a good river or lake and you are ready to anti-rage those zombies. But how do you build an effective water base? At its simplest design, build a pathway in which zombies will fall into the water. Begin the entry to your path from the shore and go far enough into the water in which the depth is at least three blocks deep. Next, construct a path which is designed to make zombies fall into the water. The manner in which they fall could be from powered hatches, doors, or from some block shapes that zombies are likely to fall from. More on those later. 
but essentially zombies path up, fall in the water, and then need to swim all the way back to the shore. Not only does this prevent rage, but zombies move slower in the water, so it buys you a lot of time as well. Interestingly, if you build a path underwater either by dropping them onto an elevated underwater platform or directly to the ground itself, zombies will follow the path back up to you rather than swim directly upward and avoid it, which can make for some cool base designs. Just make sure that if you want them to follow a certain path in the water and you have a primary entrance from the shore, you will need to block them from trying to swim back towards the shore. This can be achieved by constructing something as simple as a wall. An advantage for forcing zombies to pathing underwater is that they move slower in water. Not as as zombies running through electric fence posts, but water requires no resources, no repairs, no upkeep of any kind, and is free and everywhere where there is water. Dropping zombies in water and having them follow a path is a great way to slow down your pathing zombie loop, or just drop them in water and make the path back up to you a reasonable swim length away. Wetter is better. Remember how I said electric fence posts make zombies slower than water? Well, why not combine the two? You can absolutely use electric fence posts, underwater, and crowd control zombies to a ridiculous degree. Now that you have slowed zombies down to a crawl, it is the perfect opportunity to blast them. While you cannot use guns in water, you can throw grenades in water, but Molotovs are not working. Sorry, Taco. You can make use of the grenade shoots I mentioned previously or just aim and throw. Either way, you are guaranteed to have a blast. Electric fence posts aren't the only trap you can use underwater. In fact, you can use dart traps and surprisingly turrets, despite the fact that the game disallows you from firing your own guns underwater. Bulletproof logic. However, keep your generators dry. These cannot run underwater, so find a dry place to store them. Vultures are a pain. I have a friend who refers to them as shithawks. Naturally, you could you place some bars above you and shoot at them, but if properly set up, your horde base can handle these guys with ease without your intervention. Recall long ago when I discussed wood and iron spikes and said they had an excellent use case? You know, the part of the video you definitely didn't skip? Well, placing spikes directly on the roof above your position will cause vultures to dive bomb into them and die. Splat. A higher tech option is to replace the spikes with blade traps. Recall I said earlier be wary of using blade traps as they are damn frag. Well, you are likely not to encounter a freak amount of vultures in a given horde, thus they most certainly will last the entire night without babysitting. Plus, it will trim the beaks off those stupid shithawks. An even higher tech option are turrets, the SMG and shotgun varieties. Aim them in the air and place them above you and watch as they shoot those shithawks out of the sky. Probably a close second or arguably primary annoyance to base designers aside from the vultures are cop spit. It does high damage and can tear through blocks frighteningly fast fast, especially on insane difficulty. Cops have the uncanny ability to see through solid matter in Alpha 21 without any clear line of sight. To avoid this, the number one deterrent are the regular cube meter shapes. If encased in those blocks, cops won't spit unless they have line of sight. There are other options. I haven't tested all blocks, but there are other shapes like the five or seven meter round shapes that seem to do the trick as well. And for the love of God, do not use hatches popped open as defensive barricades or place plates or half blocks around you, unless you want mouthfuls of spit in your direction. Cops especially hate these blocks and will target you extra hard. Sorry, Glock 9. Blocks like the scaffold and thin windows will prevent you from taking damage from cop spit, but the blocks will take the hit and get damaged themselves. For the ultimate cheat code, use the crown corner shapes as you can shoot melee and throw grenades through them, but cops won't see you. No spit at all unless you use the no-no blocks. The reason these blocks work are that cops spit at you when they see the player's head, and since only your chest is exposed either by standing or crouching, cops won't spit. If, however, you move down a bit so your head is visible, as if you were using half blocks as a floor, cops will spot your head and give you a mouthful. Wow, we're already at tip 90? Time flies by, doesn't it? I still got plenty more. So let's start pivoting to some more crafty ways of cheesing the AI. If we take a trip down memory lane all the way back to tip 49, recall that I created two paths. The first, a longer path that extensively winds around and is always connected to the player. The second, shorter path as a more direct route and ultimately leads to a hatch pathway that is only available once zombies trigger some pressure plates from the first path. What this does is it causes zombies to indecisively move in between both paths, 
as zombies always prefer to go the shortest route, but since the second shorter route only lasts a few seconds, they can never reach it, causing them to run back and forth. To prevent zombies taking shortcuts through the windy pathways, one could build physical walls. However, these can be inadvertently destroyed as zombies cluster. Instead, we abuse the impassable shapes mentioned back in tip 57 to force zombies to stick to the long pathways. These invisible barriers are useful in guiding zombies along a particular route that they would otherwise not necessarily follow allowing you to make maze-like, lengthy paths that zombies begrudgingly run along. Alternatively, you can drop them into a platform surrounded by these invisible barriers and watch as they eagerly try to break free. Again, make sure these shapes are not directly touching the ground or another pathable shape. All praise the mighty Windows Store three-sided triangle empty, first of its name, Lord of the Seven Days to Die, and protector of all survivors. Zombies see these as a path, and when placing two triangles adjacent to each other to form a larger one and stack them like a cube meter staircase, they will try to climb and utterly fail. The angularity of the shape forces them to the sides inevitably and they fall. Trivialize all hordes with this block. Just beware, fully repairing it will add the window glass back in breaking the magic. So destroy any heavily damaged blocks and replace. Small price to pay for invincibility. If you make a pathway less than a two meter height, zombies will crawl lining up for perfect headshots. An excellent sniper base or just for getting easy headshots with your weapon of choice. One such way is to construct a three meter tunnel and replace the bottom shape with a cube block with a plate on top. This will be just about the right size to force zombies to crawl. One of the best base designs that works early game can be used in a pinch building in 30 seconds or so before the horde and can scale up to later game stages is simply a ladder combined with the railing diagonal. Build up your ladder, the higher the better to reduce zombies clumping and at the top, place a railing diagonal and you are set. Either build your ladder against a POI or a structure of your design. The zombies will climb up, try to climb against the railing and fall. All the while you can shoot at them or play it lazy and repair the diagonal throughout the night. If the material is strong enough, you can even AFK. Just beware for later hordes, there will be too many zombies so they can potentially jump on top of each other over the diagonal, so placing a block on top of the diagonal will prevent that from happening. I alluded to multiple times shapes that can cause zombies to fall. What are some of the best ones? Well, my absolute favorite and arguably mo the most efficient way to do this is the wedge narrow shapes. From an elevated path, build out wedge narrow lows and below that wedge narrow middles. On top of the wedge narrow lows, place cube 0.25 meter shapes at least two blocks high. This will create an impassable slide that zombies cannot pass. You can also have zombies travel over them instead of across as in my infinite slide base design or my suspended cliff base, vanilla and darkness falls variants respectively. Zombies will see the entire slide as a path and will run over it and slide down. In both cases, they use one of my other favorite shapes, the pillar 0.025 meter half side centered shape, which when placed like this will form a gap in between. Zombies see these as a path as well. Thus, zombies sliding down fall through the gaps. They can be used on their own as an effective way to make zombies drop. Some other honorable mentions are the plate quarter triangle and the plate quarter. There are more shapes too, which can be found in this video. The effectiveness of these shapes can be improved by placing a railing or bar block over them, forcing zombies to jump and fall through the gaps. Recall before how I mentioned when using unpathable blocks not to place them over ground or pathable shapes? Well, in this case, break that previous tip and you can combine pathable shapes that otherwise won't cause zombies to fall with some unpathable blocks to form a path that is difficult for zombies to traverse. A tried and true way for zombies to slowly climb to the player is a simple cube staircase. However, the downside of this is in later hordes, they collect, fight over the right to climb, and start beating on it. A great modification to this concept is to use narrow pillars, like the 0.5 meter pillars, and even narrower pillar shapes, like the aforementioned 0.05 meter half side centered, or the full 0.025 meter middle. Make a series of columns using the thicker block one block higher than the previous and connect them with narrower pillars. When zombies jump up, several will fall down, needing to repeat the loop. One of the most effective ways to cheese the AI is by forcing them to rapidly change direction. They're not the most agile of creatures, so let's abuse that. Construct a pathway using a narrow shape like the 0.5 pillar size or narrower. From there, rotate some ramps and form a diagonal path followed by another pillar section. When zombies try to run around the corner, many will fall. And to make it even more zombie proof, add a railing and position it parallel to the pillar section that follows the ramp path. 
Positioned like this will cause zombies to simply run off and slide down. Best part, they rarely beat on any of the blocks as they fall. One of my more recent discoveries to cheese the AI is to trick it into running into a wall and falling endlessly. It is extremely easy to build and works like a charm for all game stages. Simply build an elevated path, leave a two block gap and fill in both sides with half meter blocks, leaving a net one meter gap in between. Build supports and block the path on the other side with some pull side centered shapes stacked too high. Add an overhang for extra insurance. Then simply sit your ass down. Well, you could actually sit, crouch your ass down and watch a zombie slam headfirst into the poles, then drop and try again. Well, we hit 100. Must be done, right? Hell no. I've got a bonus tip for you all and it combines many of the previous tips into an important concept that I'd like to call zombie flow control. Whether you are AFKing, actively defending, or more especially trying to melee the horde at the late game stage, handling too many zombies at once can be overwhelming. So thinning out the crowd and handling a handful at a time is paramount to survival. You can dial in that flow rate using many of the previous strategies and blocks. If you dial it all the way to 100, you have yourself an AFK base. If you dial it part way, you can control how many zombies reach you as they loop around. A good shape to do that is with the 0 0.0125 meter centered block. When placed vertically, about half the zombies will make it across. Just make sure you leave a gap in between multiple paths as filling in the space beyond a single column causes pathing issues. I recently used this in my Darkness Falls melee base to reduce the zombies I fought simultaneously and our water dweller and horde base and in my water base using the godly triangle block to limit the number that made it to the triangles to increase their longevity. You can mix and match some of the other designs in there like powered hatches, wedge and arrows mixed with some other shapes as in my pagoda build. Another approach to let a fraction of zombies path is using the triangle quarter, pillar side centered shapes without the railings which allow some zombies to path over while others fall. Varying the distance of these paths and the number of sections will allow you to filter zombies out forcing them to complete the loop. Doing this will limit the number of zombies that reach you at any given time, thus making a base completely melee only even at higher game stage. You can also employ this type of trick to force zombies to run different loops simultaneously while also allowing some to pass while others drop into a different loop as in my Darkness Falls AFK slide or my recent Central Hub video. If you spread them out, they are less likely to cluster and cause damage. As we should all know by now, zombies grouping up with nowhere to go will cause them to hit blocks with impunity around them. So take care my friends, I hope this guide will serve you all well from noobs to the pro. This video could have been even longer than it already is as there are other things I could discuss and get into more granular aspects of some of those more complex strategies. I didn't even touch upon robotic sledge turrets but I think those are well enough used that I didn't need to devote time to them. If you are interested check out any of the videos in the links below which will note the associated tips to the source video if you want a deeper dive into that particular strategy. On that note thank you all for watching this video. If you enjoyed and got something out of the video, please like and subscribe. I think something like 70% of our audience is unsubbed, so please consider clicking that button and joining the posse. I'd also like to thank our wonderful patrons whose support is vital to our growth and funding our passion projects like the Mod Gen GUI. Anyways, I've talked long enough. This is Eerie Knight signing off. See you all next time.